Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm speaking today about gravitational redshift in galaxy clusters, which is a current research topic in uh, astronomy. It's something that's actually progressing right now. There are people working on it. Next slide. What's oh, the? Okay, not. Uh, <coughs> it's blocking. Let me check. What's the button? Okay, this one. Okay. Bigger one. The bigger one. Okay. Uh, so hopefully everyone knows what redshift is. If you don't know, we are in a science center, so hopefully there's an exhibition somewhere that will tell you. Uh, but the point, the, the key point in this talk is that uh, there are many kinds of redshift. There's the Doppler one, which happens when something is moving towards you or away you, away from you, and then there's a the cosmological, which happens because uh, the universe is expanding. And there's a gravitational, which is because of differences in gravitational potential. Okay, so I'm focusing on gravitational redshift. And uh, yeah, it arises from differences in gravitational potential. And the magnitude is proportional to the difference in gravitational potential between the emitter and the observer. So like, uh, you can consider the quiz at the bottom, which should illustrate what the, uh, what the essence is. If Alice is on top of Mount Everest and Bob is in Singapore Science Center, for an observer at infinity, who shows greater gravitational redshift? <coughs> uh, this is something you need high school physics to understand. Uh, the idea is that for an observer at infinity, you are at zero potential. And then the formula for gravitational potential is uh, minus gmm over r. Hopefully everyone has seen that before, or can recall it from high school physics. <laughs> All right, so then uh, someone at Singapore Science Center is closer to the center of the Earth. Therefore, the person, Ali, uh, Alice, no, sorry, Bob in this case, is at lower potential, and Alice is at higher potential. For someone who is at infinity, then the, uh, Alice will have less gravitational redshift, and Bob will have higher gravitational redshift. Okay. And then uh, next thing, next question is what a galaxy cluster is. Uh, a galaxy cluster is a cluster of galaxies. Basically, we are on Earth. The Earth is part of the solar system. The solar system is part of the Milky Way, which is a galaxy. The galaxy itself, the Milky Way, is part of a galaxy cluster. It's a lot of galaxies. There can be thousands of galaxy clusters. Uh, sorry, thousands of galaxies in a cluster. Uh, they are one of the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. Although uh, there are recently we have been speaking about superclusters, which are even bigger. Tens to thousands of galaxies. Uh, empirically, observationally speaking, we find that there is always a bright galaxy at the center. Uh, we don't know why, but it is something that the uh, model of galaxy for, uh, cluster formation must account for. <coughs> okay, so then in 2011, which was relatively recently, this group of researchers, Wojtek et al., said that they found gravitational redshift. Uh, the reason it took so long to discover is because redshift can be translated into a s velocity, a speed, and then uh, according to calculations, we are expecting about 10 kilometers per second of redshift. Uh, but then because of the expansion of the universe, we are also seeing things moving further and further away, and that background is 1, 000, a few thousand kilometers per second. So this is a percentage effect and it's very small and difficult to see. Uh, the method we, that was used by Watchtech et al. to find it is this one, plotting the velo velocities of cluster components against the brighter center galaxy. Uh, it's not immediately obvious how this works, but I'll explain it in the next few slides. Uh, for theoretical reasons, and also observationally, we know that the brightest cluster galaxy is near the potential minimum, so it is at the lowest potential. Uh, it's the equivalent of being at Science Center compared to Mount Everest. Uh, the expected result from this is the Gaussian. I'm not sure if everyone has seen what a Gaussian is, but it's on the next slide. This is what it looks like. Uh, hof hopefully everyone's familiar with this, uh, and they know roughly when this shows up. This is happens when you have no idea about anything. For example, if you go to Orchard Road, and then you count the number of people moving towards the left, and the people moving towards the right, and then you average their speeds, it will look something like this. Uh, if you have 100 people take a test and then you plot their scores, it will look something like this. There are concrete reasons for it, but yeah, it just looks something like this. Uh, we are plotting the cluster's components, uh, the velocities of the cluster components in the frame of the BCG. 
Yeah. So we'll explain it using this image, which should hopefully make things clear. Uh, in the top one, we just have the, the this, this is the DCG, and then we have four satellites. The effects are uh, magnified, exaggerated, but you can get the idea. We assume the DCG is moving away from us at 1,000 kilometers per second. That's part of the Hubble flow. And then some of the satellites are moving at 500, and some at 1,500. This is to be expected. Because the uh, you have a BCG there, and then the, the the cluster galaxies orbit around the center. Some of them move faster, some of them move slower. So, but then it's centered around zero, so it averages to zero. Uh, now we add gravitational redshift, because the BCG is at the lowest gravitational potential. It shows the greatest greatest gravitational redshift. Redshift. So from thousand to thousand one hundred. Okay. Uh, the ones that are closer to the BCG will show less, but larger than the ones that are further away. So in this case, it's increased by 50, and in this case, it's increased by 10. And now we move to the ref rest frame of the BCG. In this frame, the BCG does not move. But now, the, if we compute it here, we subtract, we get this. Hopefully, it's obvious. You can com compute it yourself. 510 minus 1,100 1, gives you 5,900 negative. So the point is that you can see from this that uh, it's no longer around zero. There is a more negative part and the positive part decreases. So in the Gaussian from the previous slide, it's no longer around zero. It's now slightly to the left. Right. Then uh, this is what is the actual results from Wojtek's paper. They said that the for the galaxies that are close by, there's this shift, and then this shift, and then this shift, and this shift. It's all negative. And then using these results, using these results, we can plot the what is expected by three different theories of gravity. What is expected, and then you can uh, you can judge, you can conclude based on this that the general relativity is still not eliminated. This one, TVs, is probably eliminated. And this one, FR gravity, is not animated as well. OK? All right, then we'll move on. Uh, <coughs> what can possibly go wrong with this measurement? Uh, from what I presented just now, it looks quite foolproof, but it's not the case. Because uh, when I started this talk, I mentioned that there are three kinds of redshift. There are actually more than that. So there are a lot of things like transverse Doppler effect can, can change the redshift that you see. Lycone effect and the surface brightness effect can also change the, the, how bright the thing appears to be. And then we have misidentification of the BCG. Like if you identify the wrong galaxy as a BCG, then you have an absolute problem. Uh, like in this image, you have two BCGs. You have a galaxy here that's moving at 40 kilometers per second towards the left. But if you identify it to the other BCG, then it is, uh, it's uh, receding at 40 kilometers per second. So it results in a problem as well. This is the current state of the art of the same measurement. It's the same thing, same kind of thing. Uh, I won't go into the details about all, the, all this stuff here, but the point is that the measurement appears to be holding up. We have used uh, more bigger and more galaxies as our data, and yeah, we still see the same trend. Uh, what's next for the field in this case is that uh, it's always possible to add more data. It's always possible to add more theoretical effects that we have not considered into our analysis. Uh, for example, the, if we move back to this chart, uh, when we computed this, one of the things we assumed is a certain mass distribution, like how, the, how matter is arranged in the cluster. So this assumption could be wrong. So, oops. <coughs> So it leads to new mass distribution. It could also lead eventually to a new theory of gravity. We don't know. OK, so that's it. I hope I've made this understandable. All right, does anyone have any questions about what I've said? The data is based on observation from, uh, from telescopes? Uh, telescopes, yes. 
telescopes the the kind of big arrays like uh, not the kind of arrays or like the tiny mouse one those are too small so unfortunately uh, but the big ones like uh, slow and digital sky survey and that kind of thing is there a fixed algorithm for identifying the right species sorry is there a fixed algorithm or is there a best one in the no, there isn't, unfortunately. That's why it's possible to, be, to misidentify. That's why there are errors. That's, why, that's how science moves forward. So why don't we just uh, pick one and then do it? And then pick because when your sample size is one, then you, have, like, you cannot deduce anything based on the sample size of one. Like in all these... Uh, wait, let me move back. This, this uh, chart was created using something like a few hundred thousand galaxy clusters. So it's definitely more reliable than the size of one. And in NUS, you have the capability to, to retrieve some data from uh, like other groups, or how, how does it work in the future? Uh, you, need to, you need to be part of the consortium, I think. But then, uh, usually the data is publicly available, so yes, you can get this data. All right. I hope I've given you an illustration of what real astronomy research looks like. Uh, we don't usually look through telescopes anymore. We just look at the data. <laughs> okay. 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 So thank you very much. Thank you together for being. Okay. So uh, love.